right now, I think we just want to focus on the way Rousseau is imagining f passions as the beginning of language and how he's imagining this transposition of the situation of instinct and isolated families to the new situation of language, nations, and love. This is the way he gets to this theory about the relationship between music and language, and this is this in, the, in, the, in the section 12 that you read, where he comes up with this claim that verse, singing, and speech have a common origin. Around the fountains of which I spoke, the first discourses were the first songs. So he's, he's adding something to his previous story, which is saying those first words of love were actually songs of love. Right? This is very romantic, of course. Right? So what we get is, instead of just having that first young suitor speaking to the young maiden, he's got that young suitor singing. And he says, and these are the reasons, he says, with the first voices came the first articulations or sounds formed according to the respective passions that dictated them. So again, you recall, he wants to link language to passion, that passion was at the origin of language, and this is, this is how he does it, through music, in a sense. Anger produces menacing cries articulated by the tongue and the palate, but the voice of tenderness is softer, its medium is the glottis. And such an utterance becomes a sound. It may occur with ordinary or unusual tones. It may be more or less sharply accented according to the feeling to which it is joined. Thus, rhythm and sounds are born with syllables. All voices speak under the influence of passion, which adorns them with all their eclat. So the key here is that the way in which language has articulations depends upon accent and articulation is the same way in which music depends upon articulation, which is to say there are rhythm and sounds that are like the syllables of language. You recall that original cry of passion having no articulation. It's just a cry with no interruption. And he's saying we need to have those interruptions in order to create syllables. Those are the interruptions of rhythm. Those are the interruptions of different tones, high tones, low tones, perhaps. And those are also the same types of interruptions and modulations that you get with passions, with anger having certain types of articulate cries and then tenderness having different ones, and trying to then translate those different passions into the voice creates articulation, which creates music in the first place, but then also language at the same time. And so he's imagining that, that those two things going on at the same time, which is to say, well, it's actually it's, it's the same thing. He's saying that, that, that if, if you've got that undifferentiated sound, turning that into articulated sound is a creation of music, and it's also a creation of language at the same time, because they're both really doing that same task of taking a kind of uh, uh, unarticulated sound with no differentiations and turning it into a sound that has those interruptions, that has those highs and lows, the differentiations within that, um, that continuum sound. The warrant, I'm not sure what, you know, again, he argues a lot from imagining what must have been from basically starting out with his assumptions about how things work. And so if one of the big assumptions that he had was that strangeness is the root of new knowledge and familiarity leads you to ignorance, here he has this one where he says, or rather, that was the only language in those happy climes and happy times when the only pressing needs that required the agreement of others were those to which the heart gave birth. Where, in a sense, he's saying that the, the key change that we're talking about is a change in this move from instinct to passion, and that that was a kind of happy time in which you're able to overcome the limitations of the isolation and the instinct and move to the happiness of, of love, is what he's saying, right? With, with which the heart gave birth. And he's indicating here then that that, that shift is, is part of our, really our conception of the difference between instinct and passion and feeling. 
right? So instinct on the one side, feeling on the other, we know this difference, there must have been an origin of this difference sometime before. So he's not giving us really evidence for this except from his conception of how things exist now and trying to extrapolate that back into the past. So he's, in a sense, he's arguing from assumptions. So in a sense, he's not using evidence so much as just warrants as the basis for his, his claims and his reasons. So you know, he's, he doesn't give us much in the way of hard evidence, right? That we, that's what we've, we've seen. And a lot of the basis for his arguments are warrants, in effect. And that also goes back to his method of imagining that we don't need revelation, right? So it's, it's not something that's particular to the way things happen. All we c should or need to depend on is the nature of things. And so he's imagining that it's the nature of things, but also it's, as a practical matter, he's making assumptions about the nature of things, and that's what he's arguing back from.